How about now? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Woo! Let's hear it for Paul. And that just made me go longer, Nate, if you're hearing this. So they gave me a hard time because I went long. I said, you guys just got to shorten what you do because I haven't been up here in a year, so I'm taking my time. But it's great to have you guys out here. Uh, if you don't know me, I don't think I see a lot of unfamiliar faces, but my name is Scotty and uh, filling in for Chris. So you guys had the pleasure of having the best looking one of the bunch up here. And I know that's not saying much, but at least I can claim that title. So if you're out there and you're homely and you want to fit in, great place to go. You'll be better looking than at least four people in this church or five people in this church. So um, anyone go to Winter Jam Thursday night? Yes, awesome time. It was awesome. They had the whole gamut. I would encourage anybody to go there. So they had contemporary worship all the way to some dude just screaming at a microphone. So whatever your pleasure was, they had it. Um, I just say that because I think sometimes we as uh, old folks, I guess, old people, we, uh, we tend to look at our youth and, and we're scared and we think, man, they just, they don't have it together. We're in trouble, Right. Um, but it was very encouraging to me, and for no other reason than um, I got to be around thousands of young people raising their hands and praises to Jesus and pouring their heart out to Jesus, you know, and then I thought, well, you know, maybe it's not so bad. You know, God knows what he's doing. God's in control. I'm not the judge of it, so maybe it's not so bad. It was just an awesome thing to see. I would encourage anybody to go to that just if not for nothing else than that reason, to really experience all these youth coming together and praising and worshiping God. So um, this morning, though, we're going to be uh, talking about a, a topic that uh, we've been kind of going through quite a bit in our small group study. Um, and it's a topic that I believe a lot of Christians really, they have a lot of trouble with uh, in today's society. We, we battle it, uh, and I think it affects a lot of Christians a lot. Uh, I believe that we're held back so much from what God has called us to do and truly living out uh, our Christian faith because of it. Uh, and it's really, to me, we have an identity crisis uh, within Christians. And we'll get into that a little bit. So let's go ahead and uh, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you uh, that you brought us here this morning, God, that uh, um, all these people could have chosen somewhere else to be, but yet they've chosen this morning to come here and to worship you, and we're so thankful for that, God, and we just pray anything that would hinder our worship this morning would be left outside the door, that our hearts and minds be focused on you and giving you all the praise and glory that only you are worthy of. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, um, you know, we as Christians, we're kind of at an odd place because we live in the world, right, but we're told not to be of the world. So we have this battle that goes on, and, and so we hold on to a lot of things in our past that hinders us from really understanding who you are in Christ and living out the life that God has for you. And we choose to go down different paths because we don't understand our value comes from God and not from what society tells us or places on us. Um, you know, we've fallen into the trap, just like everybody else, of a line. Everything that's outside of Jesus determine who we are and determine what our worth is and our value is. And so much so that I believe that it hindered us, hindered us from being the church that God designed us to be and living out a life that we all are called to as Christians. You know, we let the world define us. If I were to ask you guys in here who you are, what would you say to that question? That seems like an easy question, but what would you say this morning if I were to ask you, who, you, who are you? Now, I know we're in church and it's Sunday, right? So most of us are going to be the holy person and say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Christ because it's Sunday. But I would ask you, if I were to go to everybody that you came into contact with from last Sunday to this Sunday and ask them, who you are, what would they say? Would they know that you're a Christian? Would they know that you're a disciple of Christ? Because that's what's important is how you're living your life outside of these four walls. That's who you are. 
And here it's easy to raise our hands and praise because we're all family, right? Out there and how we live our life out there is what matters. Most of us, though, and most people, if we're honest, we would say, well, I'm so-and-so. I know I would say, well, I'm a, a dad. You know, I'm the dad of Trey, Chase, and Kobe, or I'm married to Nicole. I'm Nicole's husband. Christian is on there somewhere. It might not be at the top, but it's on there somewhere when it should be at the top. And if I were to ask you honestly, when is the last time that you've shared your faith with somebody, what would you say? Would it be yesterday, last week, last month, hopefully not last year? Well, I guess it's just a couple of months, maybe. What would you say? I believe one of the major reasons is that we don't do that is because we're so afraid of what that person is going to think of us. We're so afraid of what the world is going to think of us because we place so much value in what the world thinks of us that we're afraid of being seeing that crazy guy that loves Jesus and that they're not going to love us and accept us that sometimes it hinders us from being really who God called us to be. Society has, has taught us and placed us in a, in a tier, and this is as high as you can go. This is as good as you can be. And we get our value from that, and we let others define us. How many of us in here are on a diet this year? How many has been on a diet this year? Mine has been a 10-year-long diet. I don't even, that's a lifestyle at some point. I just, and it's up and down, I just can't seem to do it. But that's my lifestyle. But some of us on here, I'm sure some of us have done it for health reasons. But if I were to ask, really, why are you doing it? Most of us in here, it would be because we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror or we try on that, those clothes and we can't stand what's looking back at us. Because society has told us that that's not pretty and that's not acceptable, that you have to be something else to be valuable. And my gosh, I can't let anybody see me like this. And it's sad that we've allowed society to put that on us, but we do, just like everyone else. And we don't have as much money as somebody else, so guess what? You're not as good as, as a provider. As this person, we put that pressure on ourselves and let society define us that way. Or we can't take our kids on the coolest vacations or give them the coolest toys. So guess what? We're not as good of a parent as this person, society tells you. And we believe it and we start to buy into it. And we post these awesome images of ourselves on Facebook or Instagram. I don't do that. I'm not smart enough for it. I'm old. Facebook is what I use. But they use the filters so they look prettier on Instagram. And what do we do after we post it? We are obsessed. Every five minutes, we're like this. We cannot wait to get to 100 likes because once we get there, we're accepted, right? We're loved. We're valuable. We're obsessed with it. Or we get on there, and I cannot believe so-and-so didn't like my post. What, are they mad at me? Do they think, I mean, what do they think about me? We're obsessed with it. You know, and so this morning I'd like to look at a few things and uh, just to give you kind of a, 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 I guess, an illustration of how much value we place on what people think. I took 10 minutes to do my hair this morning. <laughs> For you guys. A whole bottle of gel. But I want to take just a big overview. I wish I would have had more time uh, as I started getting into this. I even told Nicole, like, I said, you got to pray for me because my mind is scattered. You go through the week and you think, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to say that. And, oh, that's really cool. I got to remember that. And then you sit down to do it and God just wipes it. <laughs> and he said, okay, now you start here. And so I'm like, Nicole, you got to pray for me. So, um, so you guys pray for me. But. I'm going to do the best I can. I wished, again, I would, could have made it a series maybe and went more in-depth. This is going to be just a big overview. I realize there may be other things that I don't cover, but 
Uh, I'm going to do the best I can with the two hours they gave me. So. <laughs> so all psychologists and doctors will agree uh, that there's certain things that everybody needs to have a healthy image of themselves, to have a healthy identity. And, and the cool thing is, is that 2000, over 2,000 years ago, or even out in eternity past, God already knew it. God already knew it before science ever discovered it, that these things everybody needs. And God made his relationship and designed it around you to fit those things that you need. How cool is that, that God already knew it and God already set it up that way? The first thing that we all need is to feel chosen and significant. Anybody in here remember, I've got some older people in here. Anybody remember gym class? They used to pick up teams for dodgeball or basketball. Now, today, they probably are more politically correct, and they just split you up. In my day, they picked captains, and they chose teams. And you may not know this by looking at me now, but I was out of shape, unathletic, clumsy. I know, it's a stretch from now. But, and I remember that they would be picking up these teams for dodgeball or basketball, and there they would pick their captains and start choosing. One by one, they're choosing. And you're sitting over here thinking, oh, my God, where's little Billy at it? They'll pick me over little Billy, surely. You're frantic because you don't want to be the last one picked. It's horrifying. And, you, you know, these, all the athletic kids are getting picked, and they're high-fiving each other. And, yeah, you're on my team. And then it gets down to you. You take him. No, you take him. <laughs> and you're flipping a coin to see who's stuck with you. You know, and then you're walking over in second grade. That's where we're placing value on people at that age. And, and sadly, we've, we've bought into it, and we, we buy into what society tells us is important. And we buy into being cast aside because we're not good enough or we have faults. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you here. 1 Peter 2 says, But you are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, you, who once were not a people, but you now are a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Ephesians 1 says, just as he chose you in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted and beloved. Look at all those words that you are. So Jesus says you don't have to worry about being left out and you don't have to worry about being cast aside because you've got failures and you've got faults. We don't have to shy away because we don't fit in with what society tells us is acceptable or we don't have to worry about being ridiculed for our shortcomings when we come to Jesus. My Bible tells us here, and if you read that again, before Jesus ever created the world, he knew you, and he chose you to be his son or daughter. That is amazing. He says that we are blameless before him because, you know, he's not chosen us just to be on some team, to be a part of a team. He's chosen you to be a son or a daughter in him. That's a lot more important than just being on the team. I can kick you off the team, but you're always going to be my son or my daughter. And he chose you to be that. Listen one more time to me. Before the first particle of this world was created, God knew you and God loved you and God chose you to be his son or his daughter. God knew what you would do growing up. He still chose you to be his son or daughter. Now that should get you excited. Somebody say amen for me. Amen. Yes. Yes, thank you. 
Now, the next thing I want to look at that makes us have this healthy identity um, is we, we all want to belong to something, or we all want to feel like we have a purpose in life. And it seems so superficial to say that, but that is something that is deeply rooted in every human being is that we want to belong and we want to have a purpose in life. I mean, people have made millions of dollars off videos and seminars and movies to how to teach you how to have a purpose. There's a famous pastor out there that has a purpose-driven series because everybody wants to have a purpose and a meaning in life. You know, and there's people that do some crazy things to fit in and to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. When I was growing up, you had to have a swatch watch or you weren't cool and you didn't fit in. Anybody remember those? I never had one. Those were way too expensive for me. Or you had the, you know, after that came the mullet. Everybody remember the mullet? You had to have, and sadly enough, you know, that's coming back. I about died. My, my wife texted me and said, you know, Kobe texted me and wants to get a mullet. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. People actually look at what we look like, and they want to do it too? I must have been cool back then. Or, you know, then you peg roll your jeans to try to fit in with all the cool people. I, I didn't know how to do it, man. I just rolled it up and tried to tighten it. I look back at pictures of me, and I think, oh, my gosh. Why did mom and dad let me out of the house? I'm an embarrassment to them. And I was the real cool kid, or I thought I was. I was probably the one they all made fun of. But I had the parachute pants, and I had the Michael Jackson jacket with all them zippers. And I thought I was really cool. But on a serious note, do you know that that's why most kids join gangs? Is because they want to feel a part of something? They're not getting that from anywhere else, so they want to feel a part of something. So they join gangs or they go down this path with people that they shouldn't be with because they want to feel connected and a part of something that's bigger than themselves. You listen to every successful college coach, uh, Dabo Sweeney, Nick Saban, uh, uh, Mike Krzyzewski, what, what do they say? We just want the team, the family, to be focused on that one goal, that championship, that's purpose. And if we can get them to do that, we'll be successful. If you can get somebody to focus and drive toward one purpose, you'll be successful. If you can get your team or your family, whatever it is, to do that. Because we all want purpose. God created us and designed us to be and want to be part of something bigger than just ourselves. And I believe that's the reason why when Jesus sent out his disciples, he sent them out in twos. And that's why when God created man, he said it's not good that man be alone. Because we all want to be part of something. And God knows this about us. And hence, we have this great big family now called the church that you get to be a part of when you become a believer. From the moment that we believe we are part of this great thing and this great family that God calls the church. Romans 12 says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 1 Corinthians 12, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. So you get to be in this great family. You know, and just like any family, you got crazy cousin Eddie over there that you don't really like, but you got to tolerate, and that's okay. You don't have to like him, but you got to love him. And when he needs you, you got to be there because you're family. I got family that I don't see very much, but I know when I need something, they're going to be there because we're family. And how awesome is that, that God knew that and God put us in that way as sons and daughters and accepted as such to be family. We're brought into this family and you can be yourself. You don't have to fake it or you shouldn't have to fake it to fit in and to be accepted and to feel loved because you're family. You should feel loved. And he brought us into this family, and he gave us two great purposes. 
First one, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 15, now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength and not displease ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. John 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So God gave us this great, awesome family, and the first purpose he gave us is that we love one another and that we be there for one another and that we accept each other. Now, that's crazy to think of love in that way, but that's what God expects, that we're here to help each other in our walk with Jesus. Because my walk might be going great, but guess what? My brother might be stumbling. It is my job to come alongside my brother and pick him up and say, come on, I'm going to help you out here. If I see a need, it is my job and my family to take care of my family. The church is my family. God expects me to take care of them. It's not just Chris's job. It's not just Nate's job. It is our job as the church to take care of each other. You know, we may have somebody in here that's, that's going through depression. Guess, I don't know a lot about depression. I've never struggled with that, but somebody in here does. And you could be a good brother or a good sister and say, here, I've been there. Let me help you out. Or there may be somebody battling with addiction, drug addiction, alcohol. I can talk about alcohol, but I don't know a lot about drug addiction. But there's somebody in here that does. That could say, here, brother, I know you're struggling. Let me help you. I've been there. I've walked it. I've lived it. Let me help you. We are to bear one another's burdens. That means to pick them up, not walk over them to to say, look at me, God. I'm better than him. Love me, God, because I'm better than him. Your Christian life is not to be that way. It's not a competition with anybody in here. You're in competition with yourself to be the best version of yourself that you can be, and that's it. And if you're not picking up your brother and sisters, there's a problem. Something's wrong in the family. And that's the one thing I really, truly believe that we struggle with uh, as, as the church is we have people come, you know, and I'm just, this church in general, it, it, it's pretty much any church. They come in here and they profess faith in Jesus Christ, and then a week or two later, you don't see them. And what do we think? Well, Chris will get them. Chris will reach out to them. Nate will reach out to them. Maybe God is showing you because God wants you to reach out to that person. You know that there's people that you can reach that Chris can't? There's people that relate to your story better than they do to Nate's story? That God wants to use you in that way. We got to be discipling better. And I don't know about you, but um, I don't know where I would be without that person that, that showed me when I was early on in my Christian faith. This is, this is how you walk. This is what you do. Show me a better path and a better way than what I was on. I don't know what I would have done. The other purpose, and it should be obvious, but... The other purpose is that we are to be showing and telling people about this great gospel of Jesus Christ. That's your purpose. 2 Corinthians says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he has given us the ministry of of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter 3, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that lies within you with meekness and in fear. Ambassador is just like what we think of today. When, we, when the U.S. sends ambassadors to another country, that is how the country sees America. And what he says and what he does reflects on the president. It reflects on America. And what we see and what we, and what we do and what we say reflects on Jesus. The Bible tells us that God left us here in this world to be in the world but not of the world. And God wants to use you for something. Otherwise, he would just take you home. There's a reason that you're here. God wants to use you to plead his case through you. You are the Jesus that most people see. You are that representation of Jesus. Whether you like it or not, you're an ambassador. Whether you like it or not, that is your purpose. That is an awesome purpose. You want purpose in your life? That is an awesome purpose. Whether you say, "Uh uh-uh, that's too big for me. Once you took the name of Christian, that became your purpose. Whether you want it or not, whether you live up to it or not, that's your purpose. Can you really fathom that, that Jesus loved you and trusted you enough and gifted you with the power to do that? He wouldn't ask you to do it if he didn't equip you to do it. That is awesome to think of. And the next thing I want to talk about here, and I think it's pretty obvious, is that we all want security, don't we? When you talk to anybody about their job, or their relationship, or whatever it is, I just want to be secure in that. I want to know if I mess up, I'm not going to get fired. I want to be able to take risk and take chances and be innovative. And if something happens and it goes wrong, I'm not going to be fired. I want that security. That's what we want as human beings. How many dads are in here? A lot of dads. You guys all play the... uh, I call it the jump-off game where you put your kids somewhere, maybe start out a little step, and you say, come on, jump. Jump to daddy. You know, and they start out, and they're real timid and shaking, and they just kind of step off, and you catch them. And then you take them up another step, and then another step, and then another step. And then before long, man, they're just kamikazes. They're just jumping off. <laughs> I'd get mine as high as a uh, slide. And they're just jumping off. You know why? Because they know daddy's going to catch them. Mine got so bold, they didn't even care if you were looking or not. If you're in the area, they're jumping. (laughs) Kobe gets you around the neck on a chokehold, jumping from about 10 feet. Because they know and they trust that daddy's going to be there. They're secure in that. There's security in that, knowing that your dad is always going to be there. And that's what God wants from you. That's how God wants you to live your Christian life. It's to know, I, I can, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try this, and it may fail, but guess what? Daddy's going to be there. I'm not going to get cast aside. I'm secure in the love that God has for me. Childlike faith, just like your kids, jumping off and you catching them and them trusting you to do it, that's what God wants from us. He's going to be there. He's going to be there. Romans 8 says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in uh, Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus and has made me free from the law of sin and death. John 10 says, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. Jesus says that he gives us eternal life, and when he does, you are placed in the hands of the Father. And there ain't nobody big enough, strong enough, tough enough, smart enough to get me 
out of the hands of my father. You can try all you want. The enemy can try all he wants, but he ain't taking me out of the hands of my father. There ain't nobody strong enough to do that. You know, growing up, we all probably thought, man, our dad is the strongest and toughest dude in the world, and he can whip anybody. My kids can still claim that to this day. (laughs) But we all do. But you know what? Time has its way of humbling you. And pretty soon you're not the strongest and you're not the toughest. But you got a father in heaven, if you're a believer, that is always going to be the strongest and the toughest. And he is always going to be there. And God says that you are in his hands. And I dare anybody try to take you out of his hands. I read a story about, um, there was these, I think it's botanists, right, that look at flowers. Anyways, there was these botanists. We're going to call them botanists. They were in the Alps, and they saw this really, really rare species or something, a flower, and they wanted it. They wanted to get down to it. But, you know, they're in the Alps, and it's down in this gorge, and they can't get down to it. Um, and, they're, you know, they're scared to go down there because it's, it's kind of rough getting down there. So what do they do? They say this little local boy. And they say, hey, you go down here and get this for us, and we'll, we'll give you some money. We'll pay you. And, you know, here's the good thing. We're going to tie this rope around you. You're going to be safe, and we're going to let you down. If something happens, we're going to pull you back up. And the little boy thought about it, and he left. <laughs> and they're standing there thinking, what? what the heck, that little punk? And then he comes back. He comes back, and he says, okay, sirs, I'll go down there and get that flower for you now. And he's got this guy with him, and he says, but he's going to hold the rope. And he starts smiling, and he said, that's my daddy. Because you know why? Because if something went wrong and something, that boy was in danger, daddy is going to scratch and claw and fight to make sure that nothing happens to that little boy. Where somebody else is going to say, well, I ain't getting pulled over. Sorry, kid. But daddy or mommy, uh uh-uh. They're going to give their life to make sure that their kid is safe. That's why that little boy felt secure, and that's why he would do anything. That's how God wants you to be in him and to trust him in that way. Do we really think that we are better parents than God? That somehow we can love our kids and our kids can be more secure in us than they can God? But that's what we say when we don't trust him. And we don't feel secure in him. You are his son. You are his daughter. You are secure in him. And so now we as Christians, we, uh, you know, when we mess up and the enemy comes and he whispers in your ear because he does. And he reminds you, see, I told you. I told you you were a mess up. I told you that you were a failure. And I told you that you were going to. Do something, and God's not going to forgive you for that now. God is going to cast you aside for that now. And he comes to tell you that God's not going to forgive you, that you should be ashamed to even go to him. Because he does. Because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to rob you of your joy. But when he does, now we can say, no, devil. Uh Uh-uh, no way, enemy. You see, he is God, and I certainly don't deserve for him to forgive me and I certainly know that I messed up and I don't deserve his mercy and grace but guess what he is also my daddy and my daddy promised me that even when I mess up he's going to be there and he's going to catch me that's what we can say to the devil because you know he's coming if you're a believer and you mess up he's coming he wants to remind you And he wants you moping around and he wants you defeated and not worried about anybody else but yourself. That's what he wants from you. Do you know that the Bible says that Satan stands before God and accuses you day and night? He is the accuser of the brethren, standing before God, accusing you. You know, and sadly, a lot of times he's probably right when he says, look what so-and-so did. Yeah, he he probably is right. But you know what else? Hebrews 7 tells us, therefore... He is also able to save to the utmost those who come to God through him, since he always lived to make intercession 
for them. 1 John 2, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate, underline that word, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the payment in full for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So every time that enemy accuses you and he makes you feel ashamed and, when he, and that enemy reminds God what a failure you are and that you don't deserve grace and you don't deserve his mercy, Jesus steps in and says, uh-uh, they're mine. They might have messed up. They might have sinned. But guess what? My blood covers them. And I paid for that on the cross. You have that in Jesus. You have that security in Jesus. You know, I read a story of the, they were building the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and back then, they didn't really have the technology we have today. And 23 people fell off and died. 23 people. And you know what? Somebody came up with this great idea and said, hey, let's put a net down here and catch them when they fall. Ingenious, right? They put that net down there and like 10 people fall off, but they, they all get caught and they're fine and healthy. You know what else happened after that? Production went up. You know why? Because they're not worried just about themselves. They're not worried about keeping themselves safe. They can do their job. They can do what they're there to do and not worry about if I mess up and I fall down, I'm gone. Just like in your Christian life, God wants you to go out and to do things for him and to go out and witness for him and to go out and be uh, ingenuitive for him and to do great things for him. And if you fall, guess what? Guess whose hands are out to catch you? The Father is out to catch you. You're not going to get out of his grasp. Don't live in fear of not being secure of who you are in Christ. The last thing I want to talk about here, and if I were to ask you, what did I leave off, what would you say? Surely you guys all know what we need, right? You need to feel loved, right? We want to feel loved. Everybody wants to see a good love story. We all want to see that love story. I've even heard it rumored that there's people in this room that love those sappy, gooey love stories. And I got to admit it, I'm one of them. When Noah talks to Allie and you find out all the way through the movie and then it comes down that, God, she married her way back then. And he loves her and they've loved each other all this time. Man, the floodgates open. <laughs> and I just let it go. I love it. I love it. But I mean, in coming to faith and on a serious note, I don't know if anybody's like me, but I struggle. I struggle with believing God loves me when I mess up. See, when I, the way I was raised, God didn't love you. I knew about God and I knew about heaven, but if you got to heaven, you tricked God to get there. God didn't love you. God dealt with you. That's all he did. He put up with you, but he didn't love you. I didn't understand that. And every time I remember, I would sit right over here and I would hear the word of God come to me and be drawing me and every time it did, you know what happened? The enemy would get in my ear and said, do you really believe that God loves you? Do you really, do you know what you've done? Do you know what a failure you are? All those times you messed up, all those times you laid and passed out drunk. You think God's going to love you? That's what he did. He did it to me, and I was crippled for a long time. But you know what? The word of God kept speaking to me and kept drawing me. And eventually God opened my eyes and it was, it was like scales falling off my eyes. And I saw for the first time that I was loved by God. God didn't just want to put up with me. I didn't have to trick God, but that God loved me. Before he knew me, he loved me. And even when I feel unlovable and even when I feel worthless, God still loves me. And I probably feel that way because you guys didn't pick me in second grade for dodgeball. <laughs> so it's your fault. But I get that way a lot. Every time I mess up, the enemy says, you're worthless and you are unlovable. But now I try to remind myself that I am loved. 
I don't have to live up to somebody else's expectation to feel loved. I'm loved and I'm held in that perfect love by Jesus. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 5 says, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. You know, growing up, our family didn't, we didn't have a lot. We didn't have much at all. I mean, we had everything we needed. I, I remember seeing my mom and dad. You know, they would go to work, and they worked, and they worked to make sure that we had what we needed. And I'm thankful for what I got to witness because I got to witness them, and I don't even know if they saw it, but I got to witness them sacrifice for me. I got to see them put back things that they needed to get me and my brother things that we, maybe we just wanted. I got to witness true love and sacrifice. You want to know how much somebody loves you? See what they'll sacrifice for you. That's how you can tell how much somebody that loves you. And you want to feel loved, truly loved, you don't have to look any further than the cross of Jesus. That is the greatest love story ever told, even better than the notebook. Promise. Go read it. The greatest love story ever told was the cross. I read a story of this ancient monk, and he told, his, he told the people out there, he said, next week I'm going to be preaching on the love of God, so make sure you're here. You know, and all the people come back, and it's filled, and it's one of those old churches, so there's not much lighting in there anyways. He shuts all the curtains, and it's pitch black. Pitch black, and people are sitting there like, what the heck? And all of a sudden, a candle is lit, and it's placed right before the cross so that it only illuminates the cross, and he walks out the door and leaves. Nothing else needed to be said. That is the love of God. That's the love of God. And to truly grasp that love and, and the love that God has for you, you guys in here are parents. You know that you love me maybe, but you ain't given your son or your daughter for me. But God gave him for you. And Jesus looked down through the tunnels of time when he was going to the cross, and he saw you. And he knew you and what you would do. And every time you would reject him and every time that you would mess up, and the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he patiently endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. You are that joy, Christians. You are the joy, the love that he saw and the love that he had for you, and to know that you're going to be in heaven with him. You are the joy that he saw down through the tunnels of time and was able to endure the cross for. That is amazing love, true love. You know, he took my sin, he took my fear, he took my doubt, he took my shame, he took my regrets, and he took them to the cross, and he said, you ain't got to worry about them no more. I got them covered. He bore my sin and broke the perfect unity of God because God the Father had to pour out his wrath on my sin that was on him. For the first time ever, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why was he forsaken? Because it was my sin that was on him. And Jesus loved me that much to do it. That sacrifice, that is true love. Galatians 5.1 says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery is what society puts on you and tells you that you're not good enough or you're not pretty enough or you're not skinny enough or you're not smart enough. That is the yoke of slavery. When we take that on and we try to live up to the expectations of the world, you are putting yourself in bondage because the world doesn't care about you. The world is never going to accept you. And when you hit that level that you think is acceptable, guess what? It moves and something else. You have to do something else 
to feel accepted and to feel loved and to feel valuable to this world. But Jesus says, I love you where you're at. And I've chosen you out from where you're at. And what should matter is how does God see me? And we've seen how God sees you. We've just went through it. So I want to challenge you guys this week. Every day, try to walk in that fact that you are chosen, that you're a family, that you have a purpose, that you are secure, and that you are loved. When the devil reminds you of how awful you are, you just tell him, I'm chosen, I'm loved, I'm secure, I got a family who's going to come pick me up. And I've got a purpose, and you ain't taking that from me. See, when I do that, then I don't have to be the skinniest. I don't have to have it all together. God loves me with my flaws and everything. I don't have to be the smartest, prettiest, cutest. I don't have to win that argument that I feel so badly that I got to win because I, ha- I cannot let somebody beat me because the world doesn't like losers. I'm trying to learn this cool thing that's called just swiping right through. Right? When I see something I want to respond to on Facebook, I try to swipe. And it kills me. Everything in me wants to. But I don't have to win that argument now. I don't have to win that argument. Because I'm chosen. I'm family. I have a purpose. I'm secure. And I'm loved. And God wants us all to know that. Let's go ahead and let's close in prayer. Father, we're so thankful, God, that uh, you brought this family here, God, that um, somehow you saw through the tunnels of time, Lord, and you knew that we would need one another, and you brought us here to be the family, God, and to be sons and daughters of you, and God, we just pray that we would walk in that purpose, that we would love our brothers and sisters as you've taught us to, God, that we would understand when the enemy comes, Lord, that we can we can tell them no more because you love us because you've given us a purpose I don't have to walk and be held in bondage to what this world thinks of me we thank you most of all Lord for your your love that you displayed on the cross the greatest love story ever told that Jesus could love me in all my faults and failures And we thank you so much for that, God. And we just pray this week that we would walk in a manner that's worthy of this great calling and this great love that you have for us. It's in Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen.